All right, that's uh, that's time. So um, I'll kind of ease into getting started here as we wait for a few more people to trickle in, just kind of a few housekeeping items to mention before we get started. Um, these slides will be available afterwards. Um, I'm going to show you a workflow at the end of this presentation. Um, a hub link to get that workflow will be shared afterwards as well. Um, a recording will be shared afterwards. So keep an eye out for the follow-up email. You should be getting the slides, the workflow, and the recording. So those will come. Um, secondly, uh, the chat is not open, but the Q&A tab is open. Um, so if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and use that Q&A tab. Um, I'll do my best to keep an eye on them while I'm going through the slides. Um, but any questions that come up at the end while I'm going through some demo stuff, um, I will address at the, the very end. So please use that. Um, we'll do my best to uh, address those as we go. And the ones I don't catch, we'll pick up at the end. Um, I think that's everything as far as housekeeping goes. So let's uh, let's get into it. So the title of today's webinar is something along the lines of time series decomposition, data processing for forecasting. So what I really want to go over today and what I want the takeaway from this to be um, is kind of a crash course in what goes into doing forecasting. Uh, so I'm not going to get into too much of the nuts and bolts of what different types of models there are or um, how to choose your hyperparameters for those models. Um, we're kind of going to move quickly through that section of uh, today's webinar um, and focus a little bit more on the big picture here. OK. So the first thing I want to talk about and this one will be quick, is what is a time series? Um, because this can be you know, uh, a little up in the air sometimes, like what do we really mean specifically? So I wanna leave you with a definition. Um, so a lot of the times when we're talking about like uh, time series analysis or time series, we're talking about um, some kind of uh, metric uh, sampled over time. So maybe I'm checking what my uh, sales was on Monday, checking what my sales value was on Tuesday, checking what my sales value was on Wednesday. So I have this same value recorded over multiple timestamps. Um, and this turns it into a time series. So I can observe how that value changes over time. Um, right. So time series analysis is really just the analysis of this type of data. So that could be forecasting, that could be stuff like anomaly detection in the series. It could be stuff like classification. Um, really, it's your whole suite of typical data science solutions just on a data set that is this time series type. So the applications for this kind of work is super broad. We can use it in every kind of industry. And it's used for uh, forecasting in like uh, shipping. So we use it there to determine how long we think a package might take. Uh, forecasting for sales. Maybe we use it for stocking our shelves. How many eggs am I going to sell next week? That's how many I want to keep in stock um, for like insurance, manufacturing, this energy utility stuff, et cetera. Um, and these are all kind of different types of solutions as well. Um, the manufacturing one in particular, predictive maintenance here, um, you can use a forecasting model, compare that to the real values like on sensors on a machine. Um, and if you see a huge fluctuation um, or a sudden fluctuation, let's say, something that you weren't familiar with seeing before, uh, that could indicate that something's changed on the machine, right? So if the if the model fit your sensors really well in the beginning and then suddenly it doesn't, maybe a bearing's gone bad. So there's a lot of different applications of time series analysis um, and not all forecasting models are used for forecasting. So there's a lot of things we can do when we get clever with our data. So the biggest thing to kind of contrast here is cross-sectional data versus time series data. So in traditional... Um, classification data science, so think like modeling the uh, iris data set, the, the flowers uh, with the different petal lengths and those kinds of things. Um, every row in my table might represent a different object. Um, and we've just sampled the same kind of facts for that object. Um, so an example here is customer's behavioral data. So I've got a record for every customer and I've got some information about that customer's purchases. A time series data set would be if every row was the same customer and it was something like, okay, this is my customer in January, this is my customer's purchases in February, March, et cetera. In that case, we're sampling the same information 
about the same object at different points in time. And we've generated the time series. So that's kind of the difference here. Okay. Here's an example, of course, nothing unfamiliar here. We have a um, number of doctorates awarded um, in engineering versus education. So you can see that these are the same um, facts sampled at different times. Now to give a more mathematical definition, a time series is a collection of observations um, sequentially through time. Um, and one of the important things that we're gonna talk about uh, when we're doing a lot of these forecastings is that we want our time series data to be evenly spaced. Um, and this is gonna be a requirement for um, a lot of different time series analysis solutions. Um, there are plenty of models and plenty of applications that do not use evenly paced time series, um, but a lot of the ones will require that. And what that means is that um, I need my data to be sampled once an hour um, and every hour, right? So I need a recording for 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., et cetera. Um, and the reason for that is because a lot of models don't use something like a timestamp column, right? We're not like regressing our Y value, our YT here in this time series against the timestamp. We are going to do a lot of stuff that works with auto regression. And I'll get more into that term uh, as we go through the webinar. Uh, but keep that in mind. When we're working with time series, it's really important that we have them evenly spaced. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. Um, the most intuitive way to do it is to aggregate your sensor data. Um, so like if I've got data coming in off of a sensor and it's just kind of comes in a little sporadically, maybe it's every two seconds, maybe it's every three seconds. Um, and maybe that's because of some rounding thing and it's actually a decimal. Um, so that's a totally valid situation um, where you'd have real correct data coming in, but it's not evenly spaced in your system. Um, so one thing we can do about that is we can do aggregation. So if you've got that, maybe you want to aggregate your data down to the minute or the hour, depending on your use case and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, another example uh, that would be totally different and still cause a problem um, is if I've got a data set containing sales data for my store. Um, so I've got how much I sold on Monday, how much I sold on Tuesday, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then I get to Sunday, my store's closed, so I don't have any record from that day. So I need to do something about that day as well. Um, and a good way to handle that kind of example is by just introducing a zero value uh, for Sunday. So there's different ways to uh, handle this um, between aggregation or missing value imputation or those kinds of things. Um, but it's really going to come down to your um, your domain that you're working in. Okay. So now that we've got a time series, which is a collection of uh, the same value recorded over time, we're going to talk about the different components of a time series. So the first one's probably going to be pretty familiar. We've all heard of trends before, um, especially since they're throwing that word out in the news constantly. Um, is something trending upward? Is something trending downward? Um, a trend here, in, in this example, you see a linear trend, um, a straight line that's kind of fit through that, uh, that example in the bottom left here. Um, a trend is just kind of a change in the average value of a time series over time. So in this case, you can see that the sales are fluctuating all, kind of all over the place a little bit, but they're definitely trending upward. So one of the components of a time series is this trend. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what it means to decompose a time series into its components after we introduce them. Um, so that's one component of a time series. We can talk about the word trend. Um, another component here is the term cycle. So you can see a, another line plot here on the bottom right. Um, where we have another time series. Uh, there's a bunch of fluctuations in it, but it's kind of oscillating up and down, um, as you see there. And those oscillations don't have to be the same size every time, or the same height, let me say. Um, but what they do have to be is the same length. So a good example of, oh, I'm sorry, we're talking about cycle here, my bad. Um, so let me come back to cycle. I want to talk about a seasonal effect first. Um, so the seasonal effect could be something like uh, the temperature has a seasonal effect that's on a 24-hour um, pattern. Uh, the weather's colder at night and warmer during the day, right? So we've got a very clear um, pattern here. It's 24 hours long every time uh, because that's the length of a day. Um, it's never 25 hours. It's never 23 hours. Our days are always the same length. So with the seasonality, 
we have the exact same length every time. Um, and that's important. When we're talking about cycles, we could have varying lengths. So an example of a cycle that comes up a lot is like um, solar cycles. We talk about those uh, probably a long time ago now, but for a while, um, the solar cycles were in the news as we had a lot of like solar spikes and kind of those uh, bursts from the sun. Um, and those don't always have the same length. Um, so these are long-term fluctuations. They don't always have the same length. Um, and most of the time, we don't consider this part of the time series too much when we're building our forecasting models. Um, and the reason for that, if we look at this uh, chart down here, which is monthly sunspot numbers, um, we'll notice the scale of those cycles. So from one peak to the next, it's about 1970 for this, or let's say the first one here is a little bit before 1960, and then a little bit before 1970. So this cycle is 10-ish, let's say, years long. Most of the time, when we're building these forecasting models, we're not too concerned about the cycle because we're not trying to forecast at that length, right? So most of our applications, like stocking shelves or lots of things in business, um, we don't need to really concern ourselves too much about cycles or patterns of this length um, because we're really not going to be forecasting 10 plus years out on most of these things. Um, and we're likely to see kind of the underlying patterns change in our time series by then anyway. Um, so what do we do about that? Um, obviously, we can't just ignore it because there's a very strong pattern. We see it very clearly here. Um, but take for a minute this kind of a period right at the beginning of the monthly sunspot graph down there, um, right at the beginning, like 1950 to 1955. That looks pretty much like a straight line. It's just kind of trending upwards. So the thing about a cycle is because the period is so long, locally, we can look at these patterns um, as trends. So it's you can think of a cycle also as a change in the trend over time. So most of the time, we'll deal with trends and then these seasonal effects right here. A remind, reminder that the difference between a cycle and a seasonal effect is that seasonal effects have specific lengths that don't change. Um, and usually that length will be tied to something concrete kind of in the domain. Um, so the example I gave was uh, um, a 24 hour pattern for like temperature outside. Um, and I'll also see a pattern on a yearly basis um, as well. So keep those in mind um, when we're working with this. Uh, Another benefit to these seasonal effects being of a fixed length is that we're going to be able to handle them much more specifically um, when we get to the actual how of decomposing these signals, these time series. Um, and then the final bit, this is just kind of what's left over. So I've taken my original time series, I've extracted that trend line, removed it from the series. I've looking at, looked at those repeating patterns that are of a fixed length, those seasonal patterns, and I've subtracted those out as well. And what I'm left over with is called the residuals. So this is the remains of my time series after I've extracted the trend pattern and the seasonal effect pattern. Okay. All right, so there's a couple different types of seasonality. Um, and I'm kind of gonna move through these two slides quickly. Um, I just wanna give you an overview here. So. Two types of seasonalities are additive seasonality and multiplicative seasonality, uh, because it is definitely possible to have um, both or multiple seasonalities, uh, which is something I'm going to touch on in the example at the end. Um, so, for example, if I've got a data set that has both a daily pattern in it and a weekly pattern in it, um, then I've got two seasonalities that are stacked on top of each other. Um, but this can also come into play if I've got a significant trend. So this is additive seasonality. Um, we can see that my time series is trending upward um, and I've got some of these up and down patterns in it as it trends upward. Um, it's really clear in this middle one, um, but the scale of those patterns stays constant. And that's why we call it additive because we've got the trend line and on top of that trend line, we're adding a constant um, seasonal pattern. Now, what's the difference between that in multiplicative seasonality. So the difference between um, additive and multiplicative seasonality 
is imagine instead of taking your trend and on top of that, adding an extra pattern, we multiply. And the way we can see this in a time series is uh, when the scale of that um, seasonal pattern, that repeating pattern grows um, as the uh, series grows. So you can see here, my series is kind of trending upward a bit. Um, and also as it does that, this seasonal pattern grows in amplitude. That's very suggestive that it's multiplicative. Okay, so now I wanna introduce a component and I'm gonna show you this component in the demo at the end. Um, but there's this component and um, I'll make sure you get this link in, in your follow-up email. So don't worry too much about that. It's called time series classical decomposition. Um, so if you lose the email or anything like that, just go to hub.nime.com and just search classical decomposition and you'll find it right away. So what this node or component is going to do is it's going to kind of break down our time series, just as I talked about in that uh, the last couple of slides. So it's going to remove a trend. It's going to um, remove some seasonal factors and it's going to give you the residual. So there's a couple of things to configure in here. Um, the first one being pretty obvious, we select what column we want to play with. The second one is that you're going to have to select the seasonal cycle, the length of the seasonal cycle. Um, so most of the time, um, we're pretty familiar with what that seasonal length is going to be going into an analysis because we've got a good hunch about our data. Um, but we can also see it by using a line plot um, as well as another um, diagnostic plot that I'll show you in the demo called the autocorrelation function. Okay, so we'll have to figure out our seasonal length as our first step. Um, set that here in the configuration dialog. And then we'll choose whether it's additive or multiplicative seasonality. And that's another one that you'll want to take. Just take a peek at your time series, um, use a line plot and try to determine which one it is. Um, if it looks like you're not really sure, then uh, it should be safe to go with additive. Um, but you can try both. This one's really obvious, for example, on the left that it's uh, got a growing size of that seasonal pattern, um, but it could be more subtle. The next option is the trend estimation method. Most of the time I go with a uh, polynomial curve fitting trend. Um, so this is going to allow you, if you set it to uh, one, for example, the maximum degree of your polynomial will be one and you'll fit a straight line through it. If you set it to two, you'll be able to fit a quadratic line through it, um, three, a cubic and so on. Um, most of the time, again, here, I go with a one for a linear trend. Um, if you are pretty convinced, you know, that you've got a strong quadratic trend in your data set, I don't think any of these screenshots um, show examples of strong quadratic trends, but if you're sure you've got a quadratic trend in your data, um, definitely go for that. I mean, you'll be able to see it kind of curving upwards um, in a line plot, uh, but I like to avoid it unless I'm sure that there's one there um, because what we can get is a quadratic curve fitting to a time series that doesn't have a quadratic curve. Um, and that can get kind of wonky. So if your trend looks linear, I would leave it um, as a value of one down there. Okay. So we've talked about a time series. We've talked a little bit about the components of a time series um, and introduced the classical decomposed signal um, component as a way to uh, break that down inside of a nine workflow. Now, what do we do once we get there? So the model that we talk about a lot um, with NIME is the Sarima model or the ARIMA model. Um, so ARIMA stands for Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average Model. Um, so it's a big name, um, but it's a pretty standard best practice in forecasting models. Uh, certainly not the only thing available, uh, but it's a very standard model to use in this kind of setting. So what is an ARIMA model? An ARIMA model is kind of a fancy customized regression model, I'll say for general um, terms here. Um, and that's kind of where the first bit of it comes in, the autoregressive 
apart. So it's a regression model, but it's auto regressive, meaning it regresses against itself. Um, so typically when we create a regression model, maybe I've got um, like height and weight as two of my inputs, and maybe I'm building a regression model that uses height and weight as inputs to try to calculate BMI. I don't know. Um, just as an example of how you might have a regression model where you've got two separate things as inputs and a new thing as your target. But with an autoregressive model, our target is going to be um, our time series. So perhaps it, the target could be like the value of sales right now. Um, and my inputs could be yesterday's sales and the sales the day before that. In that way, the inputs to my regression model are the same time series as my target. So that's why we call it auto regressive because it's a regression model where the input and output are the same value, just at different timestamps. So the moving average component, um, we'll not get too much into that one today, um, but this is another way that the uh, ARIMA is kind of upgraded. Um, this is also auto regressive in that it's based on um, lagged copies of your past forecasts. Um, but we'll skip over that one for now. Uh, just remember that the ARIMA is a autoregressive model, meaning that it uses past values of your target as predictors. And then the final kind of bit of this uh, framework, this acronym here, is the integration part. So the integrations part is uh, the ability of the ARIMA model to do differencing on your time series. Uh, so for example, if I've got a time series that is, let's say, the daily sales value um, at my store. Um, and maybe my store is just starting out and it's really picking up and my sales are increasing and I've got a, a trend that goes upward. Um, what this integration thing does is it allows us to internally to the model difference that time series. And what that means is we take uh, the current value in our time series for everyone in the column and subtract from it the previous value. So what does that accomplish? Uh, if you think back to maybe like an introductory um, calculus course or something, when we're kind of talking about derivatives for the first time, um, we'll look at a, uh, a function, take some samples out of it, and we'll say, okay, if I take yesterday or today and subtract from it yesterday, I get that rate of change. Um, and if I've got something with linear growth, that first set of differencing where I take now and subtract yesterday um, is my rate of change. And if that's constant, then I've removed a linear trend. Um, if it's got a quadratic trend, I'll have to do it twice and so on. So this enables the ARIMA models to extract trends um, before doing this auto regression. So this is a really powerful feature. Um, and it's really useful. So, right, the autoregressive part here, you can kind of see how the equation comes together here. Um, again, this is, in a lot of ways, just a regression model, right? Um, our target is our time series variable at time t, and our inputs are, um, so we have a constant value here, plus a coefficient, so just like in a regular regression model. But these other variables, aren't like XT, ZT, et cetera. They're lagged copies of our target. So to predict the current value of our time series, we're using as inputs to a regression model, the previous value, the previous previous value, and so on. Um, so that's kind of what our NARIMA model is and what it does. Um, I'm leaving this slide in here, but again, we're gonna kind of move past it for now um, for the sake of simplicity, but do check it out um, if you're interested in this. Um, this is also an important part of the ARIMA model, and um, in effect, what it enables the ARIMA to do is uh, handle spikes and changes in the time series a little bit better. So it'll be able to recognize um, large deviations from the uh, forecast, between the forecast and the time series, and kind of use those to correct itself a little bit. And then finally, the kind of full equation of an ARIMA model here. So you can see that there's two major components. We've got, of course, on the left side of this equation, our target, which is like a regular regression model, the current value of our time series. And on the right, we've got all of our inputs to the regression. 
So the previous value, the previous, previous value, as many as we want. And then these epsilons over here, these represent not past values of our time series, but past forecast errors. And it's a little bit tricky how uh, those are calculated internally to the model. Um, but we'll, we're going to gloss over that for the sake of this webinar for now. So that's, that's kind of what the whole ARIMA equation looks like. It's just an autoregressive model where we're building this kind of funky looking um, regression equation. Okay. Something to remember when using these ARIMA models is that the time series must be stationary. Um, so what that means is we don't want to have a trend in our data um, and we don't want to have huge changes in the variance in our data. So that's something that we handle um, externally or internally um, if we're doing it with that differencing that I mentioned to remove a trend um, for our data. And I'll show you a little bit of that uh, when we get to the demo again as well. But this is no REMA model. Um, again, I'm not going to talk too much about how to select the parameters for your ARIMA model, but I wanted to include this slide for everybody anyway. Okay, so how do we use a ARIMA model in NIME? So we have a component for that. You can find it on the example server. If you open up that, it should be in your uh, workspace thing on the left, top left of your um, NIME analytics platform. Go to the example server, um, go to the first folder, which is called components, and then there'll be a folder in there called time series. Um, and you'll find a whole suite of different components that we offer uh, to help you with some time series analysis. Um, the Serima Learner is one of them. Uh, so you'll notice that this is a little bit different than the model I just introduced to you. So I, I introduced the concept of the Arima model, uh, but what this Serima model is, is just an extension on it. So nothing changes about the way it functions, uh, but instead of only talking about including minus one, minus two, minus P. Uh, we talk about things like including minus 24, minus 48, minus 72 um, in that way. So it just kind of gives us a little bit more power to control how we uh, include past variables. OK. The other half of this Srima solution here is going to be the Srima predictor. So. It's not too much to say between these. The Streamer Learner outputs this model port. Um, if you've done machine learning with NAM, you'll be familiar with that port. And it connects to the predictor. So this predictor doesn't take any data as an input like you might be familiar with um, because it's just generating a forecast. We've uh, fit this Streamer model, and it's going to output some variables into the future for us. So it's not really doing any classifying. It's not regressing on any new data. Um, so this is just what a forecasting solution is going to look like. Inside of the configuration dialog for this component, you're going to be able to select the main thing here. I would leave everything else as the default um, is the number of periods to forecast. So if I wanted to forecast one day out and uh, my data is hourly, then I'd select 24. So just keep in mind that this is going to indicate um, the number of rows that you want to output at the end of the predictor. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to use, actually, though, in the example demo I show you, because we didn't take too much time to really talk about how we uh, pick the parameters for a model like this, um, I'm going to use the auto Serima. So what the auto Serima component does is it will look at these um, plots called the autocorrelation function and the partial autocorrelation function, and it'll try to pick out uh, where in those plots, there's significant autocorrelation. And using that information, it'll try to select the hyperparameters for your Serima. Um, so this is something to try out. Um, definitely explore um, those plots, the autocorrelation, or I'm sorry, the autocorrelation function and the partial autocorrelation functions, um, if you want to learn a bit more about how to select those parameters yourself. OK, so finally, what I want to talk about is deployment. So this is kind of the big thing, of course. How do I actually take this bit information and do something with it? How do I get a forecast that's useful for me? Um, and that's what I want to use uh, a demo to show you. OK, so here's a screenshot of the workflow that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, the plan here is to go through three different pathways that 
we could get to with a deployment situation. Um, the first one here is how we can forecast a time series that just has one, one seasonality. So that means that um, maybe my, my data has a daily up and down pattern, um, but no weekly up and down pattern. And uh, then secondly, down here to show you what happens when there's two seasonalities. Um, so this is something that we'll have to deal with a little bit differently. Um, yes. Okay. And I'm going to get to the demo. I do see a couple of questions in the chat now, so I'll address um, one of them now, and I'll get to the other one at the end for a wrap up. Uh, so the first one was, uh, are we going to have um, a recording in the slides? Um, yes, you can expect a follow-up email a little bit later today or tomorrow um, that will have the recording of the session. Um, it'll have the slides and, and it'll have um, links to this, uh, uh, the workflows that I had in the slides as well as the demo I'm gonna show you here in a second. So. That will be given to you. Um, and then just to address the next question while we're here, uh, is Arima X or something else usable? Um, so I'm gonna show you one other thing in this demo. Uh, short answer is not yet, but it will be very soon. Um, so I'll show you that when I get to the demo. Um, is right now what I'm uh, showing you all is these components that you're gonna get from the example server, uh, but we are preparing to publish some actual nodes in an extension here in the next uh, month or two. So keep an eye out for those um, as something to look forward to. Okay. So let me swap my screen share and go over here. Okay. Uh... All right. I think you should all see my Nine Analytics platform now. Um, let me know if you don't. Um, I'm gonna close my Q&A tab so you guys don't have to stare at that while I'm doing it. Um, and we'll circle back to the remaining questions uh, at the end here in a little bit. Okay, so in this workflow, I've got just two different data sets, but three different kind of pipelines to my workflow here. Uh, the first one I wanna show you is up here, well, what to do when we're forecasting um, a time series that it's pretty a simple time series. It's uh, just got one seasonality in it. Um, and yeah, how we can handle that. So in this case, I've got some missing values that I need to deal with, um, but we can do that. So I've done that using, first of all, this node called the timestamp alignment. Um, so what this node will do is you can uh, select a period. So in this case, my data is hourly. Um, selecting which column has the timestamp values in it. And I'm going through that and kind of re resyncing those. So when this is really useful, you might not have um, a record for every timestamp. Uh, the example I gave in the slides was if your store is closed on Sundays, you might not have a zero value in your data set. You might just have no record. Um, and this is super useful and super important uh, because we do need evenly spaced time series to use this type of model. Um, so what does this do? So what it'll do is if it detects that there's no record uh, for, for in this case, uh, no record for 3 a.m., it'll go ahead and add a row um, with 3 a.m. and just give you a missing value. So this is really useful because it gives us um, insight into where we even have missing values in the first place. And then we can go forward, use the missing value node, and uh, handle them. So in this case, since these are values, um, these are uh, temperature values uh, in LA, and uh, I know that the temperature for the most part changes linearly. If it's gonna be you know, 50 degrees tonight and it's 80 degrees right now, I can expect it to linearly descend in a continuous fashion. Maybe not linearly, but it'll descend in a continuous fashion uh, towards 50 degrees. It's not gonna jump down to 30 instantly and then back up. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Know your time series uh, when you're selecting your missing value imputation approach. Um, so other really good solutions for this are to use something like uh, uh, fixed value here. So in the example of my store, I might use a fixed value and set it to zero. Um, 
if my data is kind of randomly fluctuating around a mean, like maybe it's on a sensor or something and I want to impute those values, a good way to do that might be with the mean value. Um, so you just kind of have to know your time series. This is very much a domain specific kind of question, which missing value imputation approach should I use? Um, but in this case, since I know that there's continuity in the value that I'm recording, I'm going to use this linear interpolation. Okay. And I didn't change anything, so we won't reset it. Um, right. So now we can see that all of my um, timestamps have been fixed up so that I have an hourly record and all of those missing values in my temperature column that I discovered are now fixed up. Okay. So I want to pull up a line plot really quick, kind of in addition, just to kind of show you what this time series looks like before we do any forecasting with it. Um, because this is definitely going to be important uh, when you're working on this kind of stuff. Okay. So looking at my time series, I've got, um, you know, hourly information here. It's uh, fluctuating, not at the same level constantly. Like some of these uh, fluctuations are weaker than others, uh, but that's going to just be some randomness in my data that I'll have to um, deal with. Um, I do see these two spikes here. Um, and uh, I believe this is Celsius data. Uh, so I don't think that the temperature in LA actually got up to 60 or 70 Celsius, um, especially not given that it looks like a very strong break uh, from my continued continuity down here. Um, so this is a spot where I might go in and use something like an outlier detection node uh, to remove things that are a certain um, number of standard deviations away from the mean. Um, after generating that missing value with the uh, remove uh, outlier node, I'd probably do some linear interpolation here again and just connect these points. Um, so I look at these and I assume, oh, something went wrong with my sensor. Maybe the sun hit it too hot for that reading or I don't know. But these are things that you might want to address. So it's always good to kind of visually inspect your time series. But just uh, the big takeaway I want to bring up when we're looking at this time series in particular is that we really just have this one pattern. We don't have a second set of patterns here. There's a daily oscillation, and then it kind of just moves around a little bit. Um, right. And that'll be different from the uh, next time series I'm going to show you. But when I have that, and I've really just got the one pattern, it's really easy to just use a uh, Serima model straight on the time series. And I can do that with the auto stream in, in this example. So I'm selecting the column I want to forecast. Um, and then there's two other configuration options in this dialog here. Uh, the forecast length is pretty intuitive. Um, it's the number of periods I want to generate in my forecast. And then the backwards length here is actually just going to be um, something for the visualization that this component gives you. So if I open up the interactive view here, I'll see um, that we've got the uh, backwards length over here and then my forecast up here. Uh, so we'll have to actually play with this one because it didn't pick up on my seasonality here for the 24 hours. Um, let me deal with that. Um, so that's a separate problem that I'll I'll just have to address there, guys. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'll do this one manually for now uh, with the regular Serima learner to show you how that can be set up. So when I'm in here, I've got all of these different um, features and these different orders. Um, so to kind of give you an overview of the parameters in a um, ARIMA and SRIMA model, uh, this P here, um, this AR order, the lowercase p, is the number of lagged copies of the time series I want to include in my regression. So I'm just going to pick two for now. Um, this lowercase d here is the number of times I want to perform differencing on my model. Uh, for example, if I suspect that I've got a linear trend, um, then I might use a one here. If I suspect I have a quadratic trend, I can use a two. Um, in this case, I don't really think I had much of a trend, so I'm going to leave it alone. Um, and then I'm going to jump down to the bottom part. So this bottom part represents uh, the seasonal features of the same thing. So the first thing I might want to configure is my seasonal period. So in this case, I know I have 24 hour data um, and I want to include in my regression model uh, 24 hours ago, and maybe let's call that good for now. So we're going to train a really simple 
um, Serima model here, just to make sure everything goes quickly for the demo. Uh, but we're including that seasonal parameter. Now, using the Serima learner means we also have to use the Serima predictor. And we'll get this. So I, then I can open this one up, select the number of periods I want to forecast. Let's say, let's say 72 or three days. And I can execute that one. So and to forgive me for not resetting my workflow too much here. Um, so we're just going to kind of look at what this forecast looks like for now. Guys, one minute. Always something with a live demo, right? Picking up a little bit better here. And what am I actually pulling? We're gonna try one more thing, and then if that doesn't work out quite for us, I'll fix it in the uh, um, in the post work and uh, make sure that it's all good for you uh, when the link goes out later. Um, the takeaway that I'm trying to give you from this one is that when we have one seasonal pattern, um, we've kind of seen, okay, this model is working a little bit better. Um, I need to tune those hyperparameters. Um, apologies for the auto stream uh, kind of giving me an issue here. Uh, but the idea here is that when we've got one seasonal pattern, we can replicate it with this stream of model um, internally. So we can handle um, a trend and we can handle one seasonal pattern and we can do that directly with the stream of model. Uh, but the problem comes in, um, and just to summarize for you guys, I think my issue here is that I need to use a few more terms, um, but I was trying to keep it small so it would train really quick for us. Um, but the problem comes in when I have multiple seasonalities. So if I've got a time series like this next one that I'm going to show you, so I'm just going to show it to you out here after it's cleaned up. Oh, I think I know what's going wrong up there, guys. Let me fix it for you. I remembered. I'm actually going to go in here and deal with those missing values or those outliers that I showed you in the plot. Um, let's set this a little high because I'm not sure how far off it is, but I know they're way up there. Um, so let's take a look at that again. Right. So now I've addressed those outliers and let's see if that fixes things because these models can be a little sensitive to outliers. Um, I had meant to, to impute those for you after I showed you them, but I forgot to. Um, so let's take a look at that one. Um, and while that auto stream is running here for a second, uh, I'll just give you a quick peek at what the uh, next time series is going to look like. So both of these two pipelines down here use the same time series. Um, it has both a um, daily and a weekly pattern in it. So let's see that. So you can see here that it has the same kind of up and down 24 hour repetition. Um, but in addition to that, um, every now and then, it's got these lower values for itself. Um, and if we count these out and we look at these dates, um, these are actually the weekends. So this is an energy consumption uh, data set. Uh, this one probably represents a business that's open during the day, Monday through Friday. Um, so maybe uh, an office building. And we see that there's a lot of energy usage, you know, working hours, Monday through Friday. And then there's still more engagement during working hours on the weekend, but definitely less. Um, with Saturday being higher than Sunday. 
Uh, so this is important because what it means is that not only do we have a pattern that reproduces itself every day, but we have a pattern that reproduces itself every seven days. Um, so we've got two separate patterns that we want to address. Um, and furthermore, it looks like we've got um, over here, probably a three-day weekend um, of some sort, because we've got three values in a row, three days in a row that look low. Um, so there was a question in the chat earlier about the Serima X and whether or not that's something we have support for. Um, and this would be a great uh, example for when a Serima X data set or model would be really useful. Uh, because what that enables you to do is not only build your model on the time series that you're forecasting, but in addition to that, on other bits of information, if you will. Um, so that could be something like, is this day a holiday? Um, and if it's a holiday, that will um, be something the model can um, use to give a different output, right? So another another value in the in the regression. Okay. So I'm just going to run this one manually again while that goes. And we'll look down here. So in this case, we're just going to continue on the season or on this two seasonality one here for a second, since I kind of screwed this one up here a little bit with the numeric outliers. Um, if I use something like the auto Serima on this with two seasonalities, we see that we do get an okay looking forecast here. I'm definitely picking up on that daily pattern. Um, you know, maybe the first day or so of the forecast. Oh, there it is. I just finished. Um, let's close that for now. Uh, and that might be okay if I'm only looking to forecast 24 hours out, um, but you're seeing a lot of really quick decay um, in that pattern here. Uh, and that's going to be because of the influence this weekly pattern has on this on this model, because it's trying to generate its forecasts based on only one of those patterns. So that's kind of what we get when we deal with these uh, uh, multiple seasonalities directly inside of a Serima, which can only handle one at a time. Um, right. So how can we handle that? So I come through here, I clean up my data set like normal, um, and I can also use this component that I introduced in the slides, um, this classical decomposition. So what it's doing here is it's, you know, it's looking for a trend um, in my time series. Uh, it's looking for these seasonal factors, um, and it's trying to extract them from my time series. And then what I get as an output are a few different columns. So I want to show you those. OK, so what I've got here are my original columns and then some extra information. So in this case, I said that I had a seasonal pattern of 168 units. So that's my weekly pattern that I'm trying to remove by a decomposition. And this is which unit in that pattern this record um, is in. So we'll see this number going up to 168. And then, of course, the seasonal cycle jumps to two, and it repeats. Um, so what do I get for those? I get my trend estimation. I get my original time series with the trend extracted. Um, then from there, we get some seasonal factors. Um, and then we get my trend or my original time series with those seasonal factors removed. So what is a seasonal factor? So what a seasonal factor is here is it's going to, for each of these um, periods in my seasonal cycles, it's going to look at what the uh, average uh, deviation is from the mean. So for example, let's, let's use a simple example where one of the seasons is Tuesday. Um, if on average my sales are 50% above average on Tuesday, then I'd have a value for my seasonal factor of 50% up, um, whatever that unit came out to be as the seasonal factor for that day. So what that means is that the seasonal factor for um, the first hour in my week is the same every week. So this is a great way to extract seasonalities because it's really easy to reintroduce them after you do some forecasting. So then what can happen here is we can use this auto Serima model not to forecast um, the original time series, but to forecast um, that residual. Um, I'm going to make one extra note here with this uh, component. 
Let me open up the visualization instead. So you'll see that it's tried to fit a trend here. Um, sometimes if our data set has um, these seasonal cycles here, but they're not represented evenly, uh, we can extract a trend when there really isn't one. So this is a trend that the uh, component is pulling out of this time series that I don't think is quite right. Um, so what I've done here is I've used a math formula node to just kind of leave the trend alone. I've just taken my original time series, which was called cluster 26, and I've subtracted from it the seasonal factor. So in that way, I've just extracted the factor and not the trend. Um, right. Again, just like before, using the auto serima to forecast now not the cluster 26 value, but this new uh, deseasonalized version of my time series. Okay. So what happens next? So now what I'm just doing after this is I'm joining it back up to my old table where I'm taking the seasons that I forecasted and I'm tying it back to um, those seasonal factors. And then I'm gonna use this math formula to take my new forecast and add back to it those seasonal factors. Um, and that will kind of give me a recombined uh, a forecast here. And I want to show you how those compare um, when to when we don't um, remove that second seasonality manually. So you can see um, I've got two of my forecasts here, uh, the blue line representing just the auto schema thrown straight at this data set. Um, you can see that it's got this unusual decay. That's an artifact of um, that uh, weekly seasonality, having that low value on the weekend influencing it here. And my with decomposition forecast that holds steady um, longer. So for the first day or so, they both work OK. Um, but as my forecast gets longer, this gets more and more important. OK. All right. Um, so we're getting up to the end of our hour. So I'm going to swap over and take a look at your questions now. Thank you, everybody, for that. And thank you for being patient. Uh, with that starting one, um, I'm definitely going to make sure that I resave um, this example workflow that I shared with you so that that numeric outlier node is included uh, in the pipeline here because those significant outliers, as I, I'm seeing a couple of comments, thank you guys, uh, we're definitely uh, throwing off the Serima. It's, it's pretty sensitive to that. Um, one reason for that sensitivity is because typically you'll use a Serima on a smaller data set. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, usually, you know, three, four, five times the length of your uh, seasonality is enough for a Serima model. Um, so I wouldn't try to train this type of model on like thousands of records. Um, it does have a fairly complex training algorithm that uh, can be computationally expensive on bigger data sets, also with larger lags. Um, so in an example like this, Definitely worth considering, do I need an hourly forecast or could I try out a daily forecast? Um, because at that point, instead of including uh, my time series minus 24, I'd be including minus one. Um, and that will also make the model train much more efficiently. Um, so uh, let me go through these couple of questions. I'm gonna make sure I address this one up top first since it's got two upvotes. Um, thank you for using that um, like option there in the chat. It makes it super easy. Uh, what would be a good example of how to loop this task? Um, example, multiple products at multiple retailers. Uh, so more or less, uh, same workflow, but I want to show you um, another node here. So this is actually part of a uh, extension. So you can, it might not be in your node repository by default, but you can just install it. Um, I'm trying to find it here. There's a couple different ways we can handle that. Um, there's this column list loop start uh, where what we'll ultimately be doing is we'll be configuring, let me show you what it looks like. Um, a loop will select which columns the uh, loop should iterate over. So for example, in this data set, I actually do have um, a bunch of different time series, all energy consumption data, but of different clusters. Um, and for example, if I set this loop up this way, 
and dropped that um, workflow that you see above into it. So something like this. Um, I'll bring that down here, put it in my loop, um, and kind of clean that up a little bit, make sure that this column filter is uh, going to work right. Um, and here's my auto streamer just <laughs> popping up uh, for that original one. And you can see that um, when you've only got one seasonality, that uh, pattern is able to stay a lot steadier um, than it would in a two seasonality environment. Okay. So when you use this column loop, what it's also going to do is it's going to output a flow variable called current column name. And you'll want to use that flow variable representing the current column's name um, to power some of the choices inside of the loop. But that's one way that you can uh, loop over multiple columns of time series to generate forecasts for all of them. Okay. Next question, uh, is it necessary to use timestamp alignment? Um, it sounds like your use case is saying, do I have to use weekends? Um, can I just do like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, straight back to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, that's an interesting thought. Uh, I think that could work. I would definitely check it out. Um, if you've always got no data on that, uh, on the weekends, um, and you want to just cut those out of your time series. Um, the Sarima models, they don't use, um, let me click that button so they know I'm answering it. Um, they don't actually use the timestamp when they're generating these forecasts. Um, so it's just going to look at the time series itself. So I'd play with it first, make sure that it works before you really, uh, do it on a bunch of time series or put it into a deployment situation. But I think, yeah, I think you could filter out every Saturday, Sunday and kind of consider that as an evenly spaced time series where um, it's like business day one, business day two, business day three, et cetera. And as long as you're consistent with that, I think that would work out. Um, if there's an issue with like holidays though, definitely important to uh, include like a zero for a uh, three day weekend kind of thing for that Monday. Um, because otherwise it will throw off the uh, length there. And the really important thing about imputing those missing days in your time series isn't so much that you can't have gaps, but it's that the seasonal um, patterns are based on a number of rows, right? So if my data repeats every week, I need that weekly repetition to be the same number of records every time. So if I'm always removing Saturday and Sunday, it should work out okay, um, but you can't remove it sometimes. So I think in your case, um, weekend's okay, Holiday is not okay. <laughs> okay. Um, to the person who suggested outliers may be present, uh, sorry I didn't read that while I was doing the workflow, um, but you're right, we got it. Thank you for that. Uh, another question here about the seasonal order. Um, so again, we didn't get too much into how to select the parameters um, for an ARIMA model. Um, one way that we can do that here is using this uh, inspect seasonality component. Um, and I'm going to bring that up here. I'll just leave it at 100. That's OK. And this is going to generate um, autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation functions. Um, so I'm not going to jump into explaining these too much right now. Um, definitely check them out and maybe read, read up on them a little bit. But this is where you can get these plots and what I see down here is that you know I've got really strong correlation with yt minus one. So in this case, I can probably just include um, one value for the lowercase p. Um, and I see a strong correlation with 24 records into the past, but I'm not seeing that correlation repeat at 48 and 72. So honestly, the p's can probably both be one um, looking at this plot, uh, but this is where you kind of explore that question. I keep clicking on type an or answer live after I answer, but thank you. Um, is there a way to perform a forecast that's not just autoregressive, but also takes into account exogenous variables like holidays and other series? Um, so there was a question earlier about the Serima X model. Um, so this is how you would do that in the framework of a Serima. 
um, and that will be coming soon. Um, so I'm not going to be able to get to everybody's questions, I don't think, but I do want to show you this one thing here really quickly um, before we wrap up at the end. And feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or via email if you want to ask any more questions. Uh, so we're working on an actual extension. We're going to call it the time series analysis extension. And what this has is a lot of the tools that I've showed you as components uh, will soon be available as nodes. Um, so you can see that the Srima is here. Um, and there's also a Srima X forecaster that we'll be introducing once those come out in the next couple months. Um, another question about multivariate time series. Uh, we want to add a multivariate Srima here as well. So look forward to that. Don't know if it'll be in the initial release, but it's on our list to include for sure, um, as well as some of these pre-processing things. So look forward to those. Um, if you are really curious about them, um, they are not at all ready. But if you go into your preferences and available software update sites, there's a um, community extensions experimental update site where you can see um, extensions that are still in the development stage um, from the community. Um, so no, not necessarily NIME extensions. But if you do that and you go and you search time series, um, you'll be able to find this extension. Um, keep in mind that we're still working on descriptions and error handling. Um, so expect bugs and all of that kind of stuff if you do check that out. Um, but open to feedback and suggestions for nodes that you want to see in that extension. Um, another question about sharing. Yep, sharing things will be included here. Yeah. Um, and I think that brings me down to just one final question. So I will do my best to answer that one right now, and then we'll wrap up. How would you fix several um, uh, NAN over a significant time range, i.e. missing data for each weekend? Um, right. So there's two ways to handle that, and that kind of circles back to an earlier question by another person about just removing weekends. Um, and there's two ways you can do that. One way that you can handle it is if you've got no values every weekend, you can use the timestamp alignment component uh, to introduce those days into your time series and um, just impute them as zero values. So you've got sales Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday and Sunday, there are no sales at $0. That's a perfectly good way to handle this. Um, it'll keep your seasonal length constant at seven records. Um, the other suggestion was just filtering out Saturday and Sundays as a whole. Um, and then you keep your seasonal pattern constant at five days. Uh, you won't want to remove holidays, though. Those will need to stay in because it's really important that your seasonal patterns are represented by a fixed number of days. Um, yep. And in that point, to deal with holidays, we'll want to be able to include exogenous variables, which is something that we can do with the uh, Serima X, which will be coming uh, soon. So keep that in mind. Um, they're definitely buggy and they're missing descriptions, but if you're interested, uh, give them a try. Uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn if you've got feedback or suggestions. And uh, we're three minutes over. So I think with that, I want to go back to my slides just for a moment. If you'll let me, let me find my share button. Here we go. Um, there is a book with PACT that we call uh, Codeless Time Series Analysis with NIME. Um, you can find this on Amazon. Uh, if you're interested in reading more about uh, how you can do time series analysis with NIME, check this book out. Um, it's got uh, plenty of chapters, plenty of use cases, kind of on a wider range of applications um, with exercises and all of that. And furthermore, um, yeah, here's my email. Here's my LinkedIn profile. Um, again, you'll get these slides, you'll get the recording, and you'll get the uh, link to the example workflow. Um, in a follow-up email. And uh, thank you all for attending.